uh, just uh, kind of let you have a chance to talk or to ask questions. We've been through a, a whole lot of um, a whole lot of material uh, this afternoon, and and you add that to what we went through yesterday. It's a good bit. So, uh, I'm not sure if you've had a time if had time to adequately process all of it or think it through. Uh, but now's a chance to ask questions if you have any. Yes. More of a comment, but yesterday we were talking about uh, sometimes the insight that they give to John Paul Sartre can give to mm -hmm. Christians. And there's a famous magician, Penn Jellett, who's a part of the team of Penn and Teller, plays mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. atheist, atheist. But he had this comment, and I, I wanted to just uh, share it with people. He was talking about Christians. He says, How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? Mm -hmm. and thought, wow, you know, it's coming from someone who doesn't believe, but he said, if right. Christians really believe this, yeah. you know, how much do they have to hate people not to tell them? Right, right. That, um, you know, Christians are often accused of being hateful and trying to bring the gospel uh, to other people. And at least he kind of gets the point there that we uh, attempt to bring the gospel to other people actually because we have a deep compassion and, and love and, and concern for their well-being. Yes? Um, looking at what we uh, did yesterday with the mission being uh, uh, tied up in justification and uh, uh, Romans 10, 10, I think it was 10, 10, we, we had it as part of our service where it says, you believe in your heart and uh, you confess with the mouth that Jesus is mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, uh, you know, that God through his word creates faith wherever and whenever that word is, is, is spoken. And, um, and we want to speak that word clearly. Uh, the uh, late president of our synod, Dr. Al Berry, uh, had a way sometimes of just kind of condensing things to... to uh, memorable points, and his point was keep the message straight and get the message out. Confession and mission. And then where the mission is going on, people hear the word of God, believe that word, they too are confessing. Confessing, you know, confessing with the lip. Uh, and to confess really means, it comes from two Greek words, homo legeo, homo same, legeo mouth, to have the same mouth, to say the same thing. And, and so, uh, you know, we talk about ourselves as a confessional church. We are saying the same thing on the basis of Scripture, uh, both to God and, and, and to the world. My point here is... Um, in kind of talking about these things is that um, the, you know, you folks who are lay people are really going to be on the front line often of encountering unbelievers. Um, my current calling as a seminary professor means that I, my life is almost exclusively uh, tied up on a daily basis with not only other Christians, but colleagues who are pastors and students who are preparing to be pastors. And the fact I live in a seminary house, we have faculty housing uh, as an option. I opted for this. I have a faculty house. So even my neighbors, you know, are other pastors. Uh, that it's only occasionally, you know, in the gym or in some other setting that I actually run into somebody who is not a believer. When I was a pastor at University of Minnesota, uh, it was different. I was running into people who were not believers on a much more regular basis. 
But even at that, because I'm a pastor, I'm working largely within a congregation, uh, a lot of my day-to-day -day work is with people who are already Christians and who, by the way, need to continue to hear both law and gospel because it's not a matter of simply using the gospel to make people Christians and then not worrying about the gospel. If you don't have the gospel preached, you will have a congregation that reverts into paganism, to unbelief, to despair. Um, but in terms of actually speaking the gospel outside of the church, it's often lay people who are going to be confronted with those, some of these questions that we've looked at here. Uh, not because they go out and kind of overtly want to you know, find some opportunity to engage in a conversation, but in the way of, as I said, in the way of 1 Peter 3, when people know and understand that you're Christian, it raises questions. Uh, again, back to my campus ministry, a time in Minneapolis, I would frequently tell the students there, the fact that you roll out of bed and come to church on Sunday morning is a great confession to your faith. In a, you know, on a campus where 90 some percent of the students had not attended a religious service within a year. The fact that you do that will raise questions, and it did. Most of, the most of the adults that I baptized uh, came into the church through a fellow student who had invited them to come. Uh, and often behind that invitation was some kind of conversation. Again, in why do you live like this? Why do you, you know, bother to get up and roll out of bed and go to church on Sunday, Sunday morning? And, it, it's, and, and uh, lay people are really going to be in that kind of position to, uh, to confess their faith in Jesus to uh, unbelieving friends and associates. Other questions? Yes, Jim. Mm -hmm. How concerned is the lay men, or I can show you the pastors here, how concerned uh, should we be about making sure we diagnose and get it right uh, versus how concerned should we be of uh, even for paraphrasing the scripture? Yes, God condemns all murder, the abortion, uh, mm -hmm. much of an example. Uh, all of us, but he's got a life. Uh, we're paraphrasing the meaning of the scriptures there. Uh, God, God is uh, intended to be for life. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, if we waited until we were really able to articulate it with perfection, we'd all be pretty silent. I mean, you know, I think of my preaching, and I think brother pastors would attest to the same thing. You preach a sermon, and you look back on it after you've preached it, maybe two years after you preach it, you know, you, we, we typically file sermons away. And uh, for one reason or another, you reach back to a file to look at Sundays, the sermons that you preached on Pentecost as you're planning to preach you know, on this Pentecost Sunday. And you say, well, I could have really said it better three years ago, or why did I say it like that? We, we ought not be paralyzed by, the, by a fear of, of kind of imperfection that we don't Conf that we don't confess. And, and you know, uh, when Luther and Walther talked about the art of distinguishing between law and gospel as the highest art taught only in the school of experience, well, you learn by doing and you learn by failing. Um, and you realize that even with our fumbling efforts at speaking God's word, he is still Lord over that word and will, and will use it. And so we want to speak his word 
with clarity to be sure, so we studied the scriptures, we are to be prepared, as Peter says, to give answer or to give reason for the hope that is within us, but we don't become so self-focused and introspective that we're waiting until we have you know, the perfect way of articulating it, because if we do that, uh, there's not going to be much confession or much preaching. Yeah? Oh, I think the other side of that is when you say, well, I've got to wait for the right moment. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of my seminary professors said one time, right now is the right moment. Mm-hmm. Because you don't know whether you're going to see that person again alive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been a lay person before I became a pastor. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It was difficult to proclaim Christ yeah. uh, in a society that even then did not want to hear. Right. Yeah. And um, while there is always an appropriate, you know, kind of understanding of timing, um, that uh, that is to say that, um, you know, when we speak the word of God to people, sometimes uh, we simply have to step back and let the spirit work with that word. We're not, you know, trying to bully them with the word or, or, or whatever. But I think what you're getting at is we ought not uh, uh, say, well, I'm just going to, you know, wait to a more opportune time. We all, you know, we speak the word in season and, and out of season. Well, I think yeah. That- Right. To declare the word of God. Right. To declare Christ as Lord. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, sometimes one sentence is enough. Exactly. And um, I, I, again, I wanted to emphasize that as we talked about evangelism, that it's, you know, we don't make Christians, Christ does. We confess his word and his name and his truth, and the Spirit uses that in the way that the Spirit will use that. And... Um, and, and so we are really kind of, God lifts from us the burden of trying to do something that we can't do and that he doesn't require us to do, namely to you know, argue people into the faith or to convince people or to persuade people. We can only confess, uh, we can only confess the truth. We can only address uh, what we see as as, as their kind of self-imposed um, objections to the gospel, but it's finally the spirit who works through the gospel uh, to make Christians. Yes? One of the objections I think that people usually have when you have, or, you know, I don't know what to say, I don't know how to say, you know, giving us a few verses that will help engage. What would you say is that the three simplest Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think as, you know, in some ways you can even, it's even made a little more simple. Uh, When you think of the Apostles' Creed, that is the quintessential summary of the Christian faith. And, um, And it really does address, I mean, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven, you know, creation, who has made me in all creatures. Uh, Jesus Christ, true God, true man, purchased and won me, not with silver or gold, uh, his own, but his holy precious blood. And, and that the Holy Spirit works this faith in the forgiveness of sins through the gospel. Um, that the, you know, uh, having a knowledge of scripture so that you can actually articulate what the scripture says, the catechism is actually a very helpful guide to that. In fact, the formula of Concord speaks of the catechism as the layman's Bible, not that you would use the catechism as a substitute for holy scripture, but because the catechism really summarizes what is there in scripture. And even if you are kind of 
awkwardly trying to bring a chapter and verse of the Bible to memory, you can articulate the fact of, of who God is and what he has done to save us in Jesus Christ. And uh, likewise, using the first commandment, when people make assertions uh, about God, how does that, you know, how does that square up with who God actually is as we know him from, uh, you know, from the scripture? Yes. Um, well, my examples, as I said, would come more from my own campus ministry experience, with, which I didn't start in New Church. We, I was called, as the mission exec told me, uh, at call day to a uh, empty building. And so it was really a matter of trying to restart something. But the, um, uh, the, the laity... Uh, played a major part in that. Obviously, restarting a congregation, we were looking at a very small group. Uh, the first um, services we had when I moved to Minneapolis in the summer of 83, maybe 12, 15 people at church. Um, most of those people, thankfully, uh, also were involved in Bible class. And um, it was really oftentimes the involvement in Bible class that would uh, provide a context that they could invite friends to come. And in fact, I even encouraged that more so than inviting friends to come to the divine service. We wanted to get them to the, to the divine service to be sure, but Bible class provides a context and an opportunity where you can deal with questions in conversation on the basis of, of scripture, which then gets you to the divine service, which is at the heart of it all. But in terms of actual lay people doing it, it was, a, uh, you know, it was a, again just kind of natural for, in this case, for students who were in the word of God who were learning the catechism and eager to know more about God's doctrine, as they learned this, they were eager to tell other people about it. And it was, it was really, you know, it, it was not anything that was programmatic or uh, planned. It just kind of, just kind of happened, I think, in, 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 in that, uh, in that way. And there were all kinds of other, you know, offshoots, uh, uh, campus ministry. Um, in addition, I mean, we had uh, international student outreach there, which was basically English language uh, for international students. And uh, we would uh, use lay people to be English language tutors, and they would use archbook Bible story books. And they would learn English by teaching basic, teach, help people learn English by teaching basic Bible stories. And in numerous cases, that led into uh, catechesis and, 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 and baptism. I'm not sure if that was what you were getting at or something else. Oh, okay, that was a little different, yeah. Uh, I was telling Matthew when I was, uh, we were driving around and somehow this state of Vermont came into the conversation. We only have three Missouri Synod churches in Vermont. And one of those churches, um, Williamston, I think, I can't remember the name of the town now, but um, I had a uh, student at the University of Minnesota in the late 80s who graduated, took a job out in Vermont. And at that time, there were only two Missouri Synod churches in Vermont, and neither uh, of those churches was it anywhere near the town that he landed up in. And, um, and so kind of by default, he started going to an ELCA church, but was never uh, comfortable there. And it kind of came to a head when the pastor, the called pastor of the church, 
His wife was uh, also a pastor in another ELCA congregation. And when she preached at this church uh, eight months pregnant, uh, there was just something that was aesthetically as well as theologically, I think, jarring for my uh, former student. And he was back in Minneapolis and was telling me about uh, his distress at not being able to have a you know, Missouri Synod church close by. And he told me that there were a number of other people in this ELCA congregation that were actually former Missouri Synod members and they were uncomfortable there too. And so I simply suggested to him, why don't you guys band together and start a mission congregation? And I checked with someone in the New England district and they were able to find a retired pastor who would drive in and serve them. And my former student was there for about three years uh, and then his job transferred him to Florida. But in the three years, they were able to organize a mission congregation, started meeting in a Holiday Inn community room. Uh, now they have their own, you know, their own building. And uh, I, I haven't followed anything on the history of the congregation lately, but that's an, uh, an example of lay people in a very grassroots way being able to, to come together and uh, help start a, a congregation in an area where there, where there was, was none. <coughs> other, other questions? Yes? Uh, related, uh, spent a lot of time with the folks in this session as you uh, talked about the theme of the domestic gospel out of the world. Uh, and mm -hmm. Um, well, I kind of hear two questions there, and uh, the one is that, uh, that we have the same language. Well, we know what happens when people don't have the same language. There's mass confusion. Babel. Pentecost gives us now the same language. And the language that we confess uh, is the language of the gospel. So that when we are talking about God's grace, for example, or we are talking about faith, or we're talking about the Lord's Supper, we're talking about the Trinity, we're talking about baptism, we can use that language because we're using it in the same way. Uh, that's one of the blessings of being part of a confessional church. Uh, we have definition, we have the voc a common vocabulary of, uh, you know, of, of the faith. And, um, and so internally in the congregation, uh, we know what we're talking about together. We don't confuse each other, hopefully, uh, because we have the same language. And part of catechesis, the teaching of the faith, which goes on when we bring new people in, is teaching people the new language. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you go into another country, uh, you need to learn the language there if you can get along. You come into the church, which is not of this world. It's in the world, but not of the world. You need to learn the language of Holy Scripture, uh, the language of the catechism, the language of the faith. I mean, people aren't using as everyday words trinity, justification, redemption, sacrament, sanctification. And so... We, we teach, but that's how disciples are made, baptizing, baptizing and teaching. And again, uh, you know, it, it ought to kind of go without saying, I think, but in terms of the doctrine of vocation, uh, confessing the faith in one's daily life is not simply what the pastor does. All Christians are, are called to do that in their station in life, in their, in, in their place in life. And the pastor is teaching the faith so that those who know the faith that we hold and confess can actually confess it and speak it in, 
in daily life. And that's why, again, the catechism is so valuable. It gives you the, all the components of what you need to be confessing. Yeah? But isn't there a problem in our day of the impact of culture on the church itself? Mm -hmm. So that language is not always taken to mean the same by mm -hmm. all parishioners. Mm -hmm. Of the culture's influence right. on, the, on the use of words, mm -hmm. that uh, there is a difference of opinion which becomes a difference of belief. Right. And, and that's why you, 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 you know, the starting point is you have the same words. Now, that having the same words means that you also have to kind of unpack and see how those words are being freighted. Uh, this is what, I mean, you know, for example, it, when Lutherans are talking with Roman Catholics, both parties use the language of grace. But Lutherans mean one thing by grace, Rome means another thing by grace. You know, Rome will even say you're saved by grace alone. But they understand grace not as God's favor, but as a power which forms and transforms. And, and so this is where continued teaching and preaching play in, so that we are you know, all on the same page in our speaking. And, and you're right, the, you know, the, the, the culture is um, uh, challenging that, and not only the culture, but kind of this um, eclecticism that uh, we also see you know, that uh, people are, uh, you know, not only uh, reading the scripture and the catechism, they're going to the local Christian bookstore. They're listening to a radio or an internet broadcast. And, and uh, you know, and they're imbibing a lot of theology uh, from other, other sources and aren't always even capable of critiquing it. And so uh, that's part of the shepherding job of the pastor uh, to, uh, 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 to, to work with, with, with sound teaching. But it's not simply a new problem either. I mean, look at the pastoral epistles. That's what Paul was confronted, confronted with. Yeah. Right, right. And, uh, and, and the thing is true, you'll find, uh, uh, you'll find Lutherans talking like Baptists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll find Lutherans saying something like, well, you've got to make a decision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is wholly un- Right, and wholly unscriptural, yeah. yeah. But my, my point is here, are there easy, there are no easy solutions. No. It, and you're back, uh, you know, you're back right where Paul was, patient teaching. And, and, and so we continued to teach, and we teach some more. And we continue to teach, and we come back to it again. Uh, that, um, that, you know, that we are not simply here facing problems that if we simply kind of put our minds to it, we can solve. These problems are always going to be with us. Um, and each, you know, somebody has said each age is unwell in its own way. Well, we, you know, we see things in kind of our culture. We see what is wrong with our, our culture. But sometimes we don't realize that this has been kind of an ongoing problem. Luther had it with Zwingli um, before, uh, you know, uh, before that, you go back even to the, to the New Testament, and uh, uh, Paul has it in Galatians uh, with uh, the Judaizers, and, and so we, we don't lose confidence in the word. We use the word, we teach, and, and, uh, 
and, and continue on. And I see I'm being given the signal to wrap it up because I've already gone 15 minutes uh, uh, over time. But I've enjoyed being with you here uh, yesterday and, and today. I hope this was helpful. If you think of other questions that um, uh, you want to uh, throw by me, my email address is on the handout there. Feel free to, uh, uh, to shoot me an email. I'll try to, uh, try to respond. Um, other materials that you might, uh, might read there um, I've suggested, but I don't have time really to talk about uh, that, I guess, here this evening. So um, thanks again for um, your attention and for giving up uh, a Sunday afternoon to uh, sit inside and uh, listen.